Okay, guys, this is the Greek. I'm going to transliterate, okay? Got, thank you for whoever posted it. Here it is. Tu megelu. This is in a genitive case. Teu. Kai. Okay. So teros. Mon. All right, there you go. Can you guys see it? I, I capitalize the definite article and the conjunction. Tu megelu. Teu. Ke or kai hemon. Tu, that's the definite article. It's in the genitive. The great God and Savior of us. Teu, soteros, those are the two nouns. You guys see that? So according to Granville Sharp's first rule, here you have two singular nouns connected by kai, and the definite article appears before the first noun. Tu, megelu, teu, kai, soteros, hemon. But now notice what follows after that. Jesu Christu, Jesus Christ. So according to this rule of Greek gram grammar, Jesus is called our great God and Savior. It's irrefutable. Don't let anti-Trinitarians deceive you. There is no counterexample of this first rule in the Greek New Testament. Let me repeat, because they're going to try to intimidate you and overwhelm you with false parallels, especially if you're not too conversant with the Greek. I'm not a Greek scholar, but trust me when I tell you, I've read the debates, I've read the best that the anti-Trinitarians have tried to bring who think they know Greek, and I'm letting you know this rule is irrefutable. There are no counterexamples. Anytime you find this construction in the Greek New Testament, it always refers to one person. They don't just like the fact that Paul you know, is identifying Jesus. No, the Septuagint is translation Greek. That's an, I'm glad you mentioned that. You'll find examples there, but there's a difference with translation Greek. At times, when you're translating one language to another, you're going to violate the rules of the other language to maintain faithfulness to the language you're translating from. So this works in native Greek. Septuagint is translation Greek, meaning it's translating Hebrew into Greek. So at times, you're going to violate Greek structure, Greek grammar, to maintain fidelity to the Hebrew structure. Can someone repost the Greek of uh, Titus again? Because I'm going to show you that. And then we're going to look at 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, you see it says, Teis, doxes, tu, megelu, teu, ke, or kai, sotieros, emon, Jesu Christu. Jesu Christu. See, if you were to give, here, if you were to give this to a Greek speaker, and you spelled it in Greek, you say, tu, megelu, teu, ke, sotieros, emon. How many persons of that? Instinctively, we tell you that's one. It's not about our great God and Savior. It's when you add the word Yesu Christu, that's when, if they're not Trinitarians, huh? What? What? What you say, homie? Homie, don't play that. You don't even need to know, know Greek. Go to BibleHub.com, BibleHub.com, because they give you the Greek in transliteration like I'm transliterating. Let's go to 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Put the Greek there for me, 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, now let's look at the Greek of Peter, the Greek of 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Now here, I'm going to show you something. Here it is. Here it's the Greek. Tu theu hemon ke sotieros Jesu Christu. Here it is again. Now let me transliterate. Are you ready? Tu theu hemon ke or kai sotieros Jesu Christu. Okay. Okay, here you go. Tu theu, this is in the genitive, meaning the possessive, the, the case showing possession, possessive case. Tu theu hemon. The God of us. Hemon means of us. Kai and Sotieros, Savior, Jesu Christu. How many definite articles are there in this sentence? One, right? Is there a definite article before that word Sotieros? Therefore, according to this rule, it's a rule you discover. You don't create rules of grammar. You discover them. You have the definite article before Theu, the singular noun. It's, a, it's not a proper name. It's not a proper name. You have Kai, K, connecting... Theu and Soteros. Soteros is the noun, or, which means Savior. And the definite article appears before Theu. It means it's one person. Tu, Theu, Hemon, Ke, Kai, Soteros. Literally, the God of us and Savior. But who's the God of us and the Savior? Jesu Christu, Jesus Christ. It's Granville Sharp's first rule. Tech. There are six rules he discovered. This is the first rule. Now, if you want more irrefutable proof, that this is calling Jesus our God and Savior, there are four other, listen carefully, four other cases, examples of 
Granville Shart's first rule and second Peter, all of which refer to Christ, none of which even anti-Trinitarians deny are about Christ. Let me show you. Second Peter 1.11, just for one example. Second Peter 1.11, look at the last phrase. Tu kiriu emon ke kai sotieros Jesu Christu. It's identical. Now, notice how Second Peter 1.1, 1, 1, here's Second Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Now, let me give you Second Peter 1.11. The only difference, if you look, is the word for God. Watch here. Tell me if they look identical. Tu theu emon ke sotieros Jesu Christu. And then Second Peter 1.11. Tu kiriu emon ke kai sotieros Jesu Christu. You see it's identical, guys? This is why even the Jehovah Witness translation of 2 Peter 1.11, 1, 1, 1, I'm sorry, 1.11, even the Jehovah Witness translation of 2 Peter 1.11, it says, Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here it is. Now, can someone post 2 Peter 1.11 in the Jehovah Witness Bible? Tu theu emon kai tu it's identical, isn't it? The only difference is one says Kiriu, the other one says Teyu. Same construction. I don't know of a single translation that doesn't translate 2 Peter 1.11 as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. You see, that's the Joe Witness Bible. You see, they translated of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? They get it right. Now, notice the same construction 2 Peter 1.1 Jai posted for them. Same construction, 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Same in Greek. Now notice how they translate this. Simon Peter, slave and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who receive the faith as precious as ours, through the righteousness of our God and Jesus Christ. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Why the same exact Greek construction, but in verse 1 they added the word the before Savior. Notice the Greek again, guys. Here's the Greek. There you go. Can you tell me if the Greek is identical? Tu theu emon ke sotieros Jesu Christu. Tu kiriu emon ke kai sotieros Jesu Christu. So why is it in the other places where the Greek construction is what we call examples of Granville Sharp's first rule, they translate it correctly. Why is it when it comes to 2 Peter 1.1, they inserted the word the before Savior when it's not in the Greek. And I'll even further prove it to you guys. Tu theu emon kai sotieros Jesu Christu. Tu kiriu emon kai ke sotieros Jesu Christu. Guys, there you go. That is the Jehovah's Witnesses' own interlinear Greek. Do you see? Look at the Greek. It's tu theu emon ke kai sotieros Jesu Christu. Of the God of us and of Savior Jesus Christ. Now notice, even in their Greek, there is no the before Savior. But now notice something tricky. They insert the word of before Savior. But still, in their interlinear, did you catch it? There is no the before Savior. Now can you give them an image of 2 Peter 1.11? Notice now the last part. Tu kiriu emon kai ke sioteros Jesu Christu. Did you notice it's even identical in their Greek? Of the Lord of us and of Savior Jesus Christ, it's identical in their own Greek interlinear. They're telling you it's the same identical phrasing. So if you caught it, man, then it's gold, right? So why do you think, even though their own interlinear shows you it's identical, for verse 1 they add the word the before Savior, when their own Greek shows you there is no definite article, but for verse 11 they don't do that. Okay, good. All right. So here are two examples where Jesus is called, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you ask these heretics, how many great gods do Israelites have? How many gods and saviors do Israelites have? Only one, Yahweh, Jehovah. So if Jesus is our God and Savior, Jesus is our great God and Savior, then who is he? The Archangel Michael? No, he's Yahweh, he's Jehovah. All right, now let's compare 2 Peter 1 1. Let's compare 2 Peter 1 1 with Isaiah 45 21 22. Guys, pay attention to this. Isaiah 45 21 22 and 2 Peter 1 1. Tell me what do you think Peter is doing here? Guys, pay attention now because you wanted me to go through this guy's rebuttal, right? You want me to show you all the places where Jesus is definitely called Theos, God, in absolute sense? Greet it, guys. So here's Isaiah 45 21 22 with 2 Peter 1 1. See if you guys make a connection. Tell and bring forth your case, yes. Let them take counsel together. 
who has declared this from ancient time, who has told it from that time, have not I the Lord, that's Jehovah, and there is no God, other God besides me, a just God and a Savior, a just God and a Savior. Now the word just is also the word righteous, a righteous God and a Savior. There's none beside me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there's no other. A just God and a Savior, a righteous God and Savior. Now, does that sound similar to 2 Peter 1 1? Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. A righteous God and a Savior, Isaiah 45 21. There is no other God beside him. And it's talking about salvation. And yet Peter says, we've obtained a faith that saves us because of the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you see how Titus 2.13, 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1 calls Jesus God in absolute sense. That equates him with Yahweh, right? Jehovah, right? So let's look at some other texts. Are there other texts where Jesus is called God in an absolute sense? Yeah, of course. The most famous of which, the most famous of which is John 1, but we'll save that a little later. Let's go to John 20, 28 and show you why this is significant if you know how to make your case. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Okay. You have to emphasize the word to him. My Lord and my God. Not to him and someone else. Not to the Father. To him. My Lord and my God. Okay. So keep that in mind. Let's look at the exact parallel to this phrasing in Psalm 35, 23. Stir up yourself and awake to my vindication, to my cause, my God and my Lord. You guys caught it? Thomas says to Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. The psalmist says to Jehovah, you are my God and my Lord. It's the exact same freezing, just the word order is reversed. Even more mind-blowing is when you look at the Greek version. If you look at the Greek version of Psalm 35, 23, which is Psalm 34, 23, the Greek has, O theosmu ke o kiriusmu. O theosmu Ke o kiriusmu. Trying to pronounce like Greeks would, not the Rasmin way. It's the God of me and the Lord of me. If you compare the Greek of John 20, 28, there in the Greek it says, O kiriusmu, ke o theosmu. O kiriusmu, ke o theosmu. The Lord of me and the God of me. Notice the Greek of John has the Lord of me and the God of me. The Greek of Psalm has the God of me and the Lord of me. Now, we need to get the Greek for Psalm 34, 23. The Hebrew Psalm 35, 23, but the Greek is, here it is, guys. Look at this. O kiriusmu ke o theosmu. O kiriusmu ke o theosmu. That's the Greek of John 20, 28. Someone's got to get me the Greek of Psalm 35, 23, which in the Greek is Psalm 34, 23. Here's John 20, 28 again. Please, guys. Now I'm going to give you, he gave it to you. O theosmu ke o kiriusmu. Okay, now watch. Here is the Greek of Psalm. O theosmu ke o kiriusmu. Okay, now here's John 20, 28. O kiriusmu ke o theosmu. What's the difference, guys? Right? So you see that, right? Okay. Now, you, the question you ask, here's Psalm 3423 Greek and John 20, 28 back to back. How many lords and gods does an Israelite have? How many lords and gods does an Israelite have? I don't know why we're putting the crown here. Only in this guy's world. O theosmu ke o kiriusmu. O kiriusmu ke o theosmu. So if there's only one Lord and one God that an Israelite has, and it's Yahweh, how can Thomas say to Jesus, my Lord and my God, without Jesus being Yahweh? But he's not the Father. So you see, if you know context and you know theology, Jesus is called God in an absolute sense. This is why I have to explain it away. Well, Jesus, is, is Thomas is Lord, but he was taught the God, the Father. No, it says to him. Ipen auto, to him, not to them. Well, you know, yeah, Jesus can be my God in a relative sense, 
No, no one can be your God in any sense because Israel's called to worship one God and one God alone. It does not work. Well, darn you, you just embarrassed me. That's why I got to go and mistranslate John 20, 28 in the subsequent edition of the Joe with the Bible, sucker. <laughs> that was a very robust reputation. And I dare say that was very erudite. <laughs> so you want me to keep going? I want more examples, sucker? Suck it, MC, call me sire, sir. All right. Suck it, MC, call me sire. That was robust. That's right. Yeah, I like I like your dreadlock, sucker. Hey, green horse. I don't know if you a sucker, you a sister. I don't know what it is, but that hair, man, them 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 look like Goldilocks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Ooh, that a fine looking grandma. Fine looking grandma. She single, ready to mingle. <laughs> Let's look at some Old Testament examples. Let's go to Psalm 36, verse nine. Because I'm gonna make it now. I'm gonna make a case for John one. Psalm 36, verse nine. Right? That grandma threw a very robust. <laughs> Okay, speaking of Yahweh, Jehovah, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Now, guys, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. So fountain light means you are the source of life. From you, life comes. Our life is from you. And we see because of your light, your illumination. We see because of your light, your illumination. Okay? Now... Let's go to John 1, 4 and John 1, 9. Let's see what John says about Jesus. Look, I'm going to make the case that John 1, Jesus has got an absolute sense. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and darkness did not comprehend it, overcome it. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. In light of the Old Testament, there is no way in the world you can say the word is the true light that lightens every man and that life is in him. And that's the life that enlightens everyone without identifying the word as Yahweh. Can't do it. So what Psalm 36, 9 said, right? You are the fountain of life. And from your light, we see light. But here we're told the word is the true light that came into the world to enlighten everyone, and in him was life, and that life is what lightens everything. Can you say this of the word if he's a creature? Pay attention where I'm going with this. All right, now let's go to Nehemiah. Nehemiah, Nehemiah, chapter 9, verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all, the host of heaven worships you. You preserve them all, and the host of heaven worships you. So he made the heavens and the earth, everything in them. He made them. He gives them life. He preserves them, and they worship him. Now, remember what host means. You have made the heaven, the heaven and heavens, with all their host. And notice the host of heaven worships you. This is referring to all created things in the heavens and everything on earth and the sea, right? So remember, host means everything in the heavens including angels, right? Because it says the host of heaven worships you. The host of heaven worships you. So host has to mean all the angels that live in the heavens. So here it's referring to the entire creation, all the heavens, even the heaven where the angels dwell. Okay, keep that in mind. So let's go to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, let's see what heavens and earth is Genesis referring to. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's Genesis 2 verse 1. Lachaim, brother, Lachaim. Then the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. There you go. It says Genesis 1 is referring to God creating all the heavens, not just the universe, but the heaven of the angels, all the earth and all their hosts, all the hosts of them. Now, wouldn't that mean he also created the angels when he created the heavens in Genesis 1 in light of Nehemiah 9, 6? It's very important you get this point because Joe's witnesses are going to try to play a trick on you. And I'll show you why they're going to do what I'm about to show you. If you take for granted Genesis chapter 1 all the way to chapter 2, 1 is referring to the creation of the entire created order, not just the physical universe, but all the heavens, even the heaven of angels, and every created thing, even angels, then this means Genesis 1. And Genesis 2 1 are referring 
to God absolutely creating the entire creation, both spiritual and physical, visible and invisible. What do you have before all creation? Eternity. Who alone exists before all creation? God. Can a creature be there before all creation? No. Okay. Now let me show you what John 1.1 1, 1 does. Remember Genesis 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning? The Greek is NRK. How does John begin? John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, in the beginning. That's the same way Genesis 1.1 1, 1 begins. So John is now going to give you an inspired commentary on the role the Word played in the creation account of Genesis. Now let's read verse 3, John 1, 3. All things came into being through him. Agenita, di autu. I think it's di autu agenita. All things came into existence through him, the Word. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Now, what John just told you, John just told you that in Genesis, at the beginning, the Word was already existing. And he is the one that the, the Father used to cause that entire creation to come into being. The entire creation of Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 1, this word brought into existence, brought into being, brought into life. Now, if Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 1 refers to the entire creation, the creation of all the heavens, the angels, visible, invisible, everything, that means the word was there in eternity, right? He was there in eternity. But now it's going to get a little juicier. Let's look at the Greek text for John 1, 1. NRK. You see that word that looks like an N, NV, Ain, Hologos. The NV, Ain, Hologos. Do you see that? That's what's called the imperfect tense of the verb I me. Not going to confuse you. I'm going to make it simple. And by the way, you don't need to be a scholar, a scholar to know this stuff. And here's proof. I've never been to college or seminary and never took formal Greek. I learned this just by reading certain books and articles that the Spirit guided me to and just meditating on them over and over again. Why do you think I'm adamant and I get angry and I repeat myself? Listen, re-listen, read, reread, because that's how I learn. I, I, I'll take, let's say, a book. I won't finish a book in one setting if I want to learn. I'll read a paragraph, I'll meditate on it, I'll visualize it in my mind, I'll play it out in my mind. I imagine I'm teaching because that's how it becomes second nature for me. So I'll take a paragraph, I'll start meditating on it in my mind, and then I will visualize myself teaching it, and that's when it sinks in and becomes second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why I keep telling you guys, listen, re-listen, re-watch. Don't get distracted until it becomes second nature. Because if you learn this, you'll teach others. And all of you teach, we reach thousands more for Jesus. We can't leave it to one or two people, man. We all got to do our part. So with that said, my rant. Okay. With that rant, put the Greek again. John 1.1. Epoisein. Otheos. All right, here. Do you see that word? The That one looks like an NV. NV, that's Ain. Let me transliterate. Ain. That is the imperfect tense of the verb I me. I me, being. What, what is an imperfect tense? Well, let me explain. Imperfect tense, the imperfect tense of I me means that this word Ain, the verb, refers to past continuous action. An action that extends all the way into the past. It's past continuous action. How far back in the past will be determined by the context. Past and uh, continuous action. I got an article on John Wallen, by the way, where I explain all this. I'll give it to you. Why is that important? Because it's saying, it's not saying in the beginning was the word. It's saying in the beginning, the word was already existing. In the beginning, the word was existing. That's the actual tense. Past, continual, continuous action. How far back in the past will be determined by the context. So now help me understand. If the word was already existing, continually existing before the beginning, and the beginning 
is the absolute beginning of all creation, doesn't this mean that the word was eternally existing? Because what do you have before the beginning? Eternity. So John, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uses a verb that shows he was continually existing in eternity past. No beginning. So it's showing that the word timelessly existed, timelessly existed with God, and timely existed as God. What kind of God must he be to be existing timelessly before all creation as theos? He can only be the true God. So much for John 1, 1, a God. How did the Jehovah Witnesses get around this? They'll tell you, well, in the beginning refers to Genesis 1, but the creation of God in Genesis 1 is not talking about the creation of all things. It's talking about the creation of the physical universe. Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of space and earth. The physical universe, baloney. How do you refute that? Say no, because in Genesis 2 1, it tells us that the heavens and the earth and all their hosts were created in Genesis 1. All their hosts, all the heavens, all the earth. That's referring to the absolute creation of everything. All the heavens, even the heavens where angels dwell, all the earth, everything in them. That's how you refute that assertion, right? They're going to tell you Gen Genesis 1 is not talking about the creation of the entire creation, even the heavens where angels dwell. They're going to try to limit it to the creation of the physical universe, physical space, physical earth, but it doesn't mention the creation of the heaven where angels dwell. Now, you know how to refute that, right? You go to Genesis 2.1. Say, wait, wait, wait. Genesis 2.1, it says, God created the heavens and the earth and all their host, all their host. Nehemiah 9 6, which is reflecting the Genesis account of creation. Nehemiah, Nehemiah, Nehemiah 9, verse 6. Ne Nehemiah, Nehemiah is reflecting on Genesis. And he says that it's the heavens, the heaven of heavens, all their hosts, the earth, everything in them, the sea, everything in them, God created, and all their hosts worship him. So you guys got the refutation? Because when you say one, that means now you can refute the Jehovah's Witness. When I ask you, do you get it? And you say one, this is what I'm understanding. We understood your argument, glory to Jesus. Now we're going to use it in spiritual battle to save Jehovah's Witnesses from the fire and silence blasphemies. That's what one means to me. Because I don't want it just here to be entertained. This is to equip you for spiritual battle, to fight for the glory of Jesus, to save the captives from Satan and silence blasphemies. That's why I want you to learn this stuff. Otherwise, I already know it. Why would I want to share it with you? Because I'm obligated to share it with you because we're in battle. We're in warfare. So, okay, so you got all that. Wonderful if you got that. Let me now give you further ties. Je John 1 is echoing the Genesis account of creation. John 1 is echoing the Genesis account of creation. Let's relook at Genesis 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning, the Greek says NRK, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was out form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. As a side note, here you have proof the Spirit is not a creature, because the Spirit is already actively involved when the creation has come into being. And he belongs to God, not to the created order. Notice he's the Spirit of God, not the Spirit that emerges from creation. So now you learn another important fact. The Spirit of God is there alongside God, belonging to God, not the created order. And he's already there, actively involved in the creation, meaning that he's there in eternity. And he's there right when creation comes to being, to be used by God to animate creation and give it life. Right there, Ruach Elohim. All right, now. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now watch here. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now pay attention to this. This is where it's going to get deep. John is going to give us a spiritual meaning of this declaration. Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening. There was morning the first day. Okay. Let there be light. The light was used to separate the darkness from the light so you can have day and night. Okay, let's go to John 1, 3 to 5. Let's see if you catch it. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, 
and the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness has not overcome it. Bam. There's an inspired commentary of what you just read in Genesis 1, 3 to 5. John told you that light that shined in the darkness, penetrated the darkness, is the creative energy that flowed from Christ to illuminate creation out of its darkness so it can find its way to its creator. So it's not that Jesus is the light. But that light is the creative energizing life that Jesus gives to creation to bring it out of its darkness. Notice Jesus isn't the light because it says in him was life. That light, that life was the light of men. So the light is that which Jesus bestowed on a world steeped in darkness in order to give it life and bring it out of its darkness. That creative energy, that life-giving energy physically and spiritually to bring the world out of its darkness into his salvation. So it's not that he is the light because John 1, 4 says, in him was life. The life was the light of men. Meaning that life that he's a source of is that light that he sent forth to energize the world to bring it out of its dark state into the light of salvation, the light of life. But you cannot say this of the word if he's not the true God who created the heavens and the earth. Life precedes the light because he is life. Life is in him because he's the source of life, the fountain of life. It is because he's a source of life that he then shined that life, sent forth that light. That light being the creative energy to bring the world out of its dead, dark state and energize it with the life that comes out of him. It says, in him was life, meaning the life that animates all creation. The life that takes creation out of its darkness. The life that brings the dead to life comes out forth from him because he's the fountain of life and so when it says in him was life and that life is the light of man it meaning that that light that now energizes a world steeped in darkness so it can live and come out of its darkness comes from him the life giver the source of life but hold on you cannot say this of the word if he's a creature because in genesis 1 there is no creature that spoke light into the darkness of the earth there is no creature that created the heavens and the earth and all their hosts god alone did it with his spirit and the spirit like god is not created so then how can john say in the beginning was the word the word was with god the word was god he was with god in the beginning in him was life and that life was the light of men the light shines in darkness the dark darkness cannot overcome it and the true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world if the word is a creature you can't say that that contradicts the old testament so this is why it's a shameless butchering a perversion and blasphemy to translate john 1 1 and the word was a god there is no way the word can be a god in light of all that is said about him which directly parallels what is said about yahweh jehovah alone and not a creature so here's another text where Jesus is called God in an absolute sense. You can't relegate him to a God. He is absolutely God. Now, notice how when you take Genesis 1, 1 and 2 with John 1, you get the Trinity. Because in Genesis 1, it's God and a Spirit already actively engaged in creating all things, giving life to all things. So the Spirit is not from creation. The Spirit is from God. And then here in John 1, he introduces the Word. So God, the Word, and the Spirit, there's your Trinity. Now I'm going to show you that what's said of the Word in John 1 is said of Jesus in the narrative. What was said of the Word in John 1 is said of Jesus in the narrative, so you don't depersonalize the Word like Brandon Tatum tried to do. The thing said of the Word is said of Jesus in the narrative. So Jesus is the Word. The Word is Jesus who became flesh. Okay, it says, in him was life. And that life was the light of men, right? In him was life, and that life is the light of men. We find that set of Jesus in the narrative. Okay, let's see. 
Let's go to John 5, 21, and then 26. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Okay. For as the Father has life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. In him was life. The life is in the Son like it's in the Father. So did you catch it? What was said of the Word is now said of the Son, who is now enfleshed. And then you notice what John 1, 4 said? In, in him was life, and that life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness. In him was life, and that life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness. Now go to John 8, 12. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Oh, that's John 1, 4, and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the light, darkness could not overcome it. So what's said of the word is now said of Jesus by Jesus. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Hmm. Party Merck. Now, let's go to John 3, 18 to 21. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, and that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. How can anyone deny the word is Jesus? Jesus is the word in flesh. The word is a person who becomes the historical Jesus, the man Jesus. What's said of the word is said of Jesus. John was sent to bear witness to who? Let's read John 1, 5 to 8. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, and he's going to bear witness to who? To bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So John the Baptist bear witness to the light that's coming into the world. Because verse 9 says, the true light which lightens every man was coming into the world. Then verse 10 says, he was in the world, and though the world came into being through him, by him, the world did not recognize him. So that true light did enter the world that he created to illuminate it, but didn't recognize him. And that's the light that John bears witness to. Okay, but hold on. Let's see what John says. John, who are you sent to bear witness to? John, dear John. All right, let's read John 1, 26 to 34. John answered them saying, I baptize you with water. But there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to lose. These things were done in Bathabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he re remained on him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to him, upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him. This is he who baptizes the Holy Spirit, spirit, the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the son of God. Wait, but John was sent to bear witness to the true light that was coming into the world so that through him, people would believe in that light. But John just said, I was sent to bear witness to Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So wait, you're telling me Jesus is that light that became flesh? Is that word that became flesh? Because the Baptist was sent to bear witness testify to the true light who is the word that was coming into the world that he created so that through his testimony people would believe in that true light that word but then john says i'm here so you may believe in jesus so how do you depersonalize it 
How do you say the word is not a person? The light is not a person. Now, one more objection that I want to demolish. They'll say, well, the word light is never used a person. Light is, is inanimate, baby, like Brandon Tatum, Tatum said. Light is inanimate. Light don't, don't speak no person, boy. You know what I'm saying, son? Light, light ain't a sucker. All right, so you understand? The objection is light is inanimate. Light is not a person. You sure? Yeah, thucker. First John 1 5, thucker. Thucker, and thee call me thigh. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. See, God ain't a person, thucker. Because light ain't a person. Light is inanimate and God is light. So God ain't personal. God is inanimate, thucker. See, I got you. <laughs> boy, I thank you, boy. Yeah. I thank you, son. Yeah. Psalm, Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light, my salvation. See, sucker, if he's my light, that means he ain't no personal being, man. Because you can't be personal animate if you lie. Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom should I fear? Lord is think my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Okay, but it gets a little worse for you, son. Matthew 5, 14. You, my disciples, are the light of the world. See, Peter? All the time, you thought you were animated. You were animated, son. You thought you were a person, sucker. Booyashaka. Joke's on you. You were light. And if you were light, you ain't animated. Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. See how stupid that argument is? And if we continue on this stupidity, let me give you further proof that God the Father is not a person or a personal being. Go to Mark 14, 62. Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. See? Power ain't a person. Power at something a person has. Power inanimate. So Jesus sits at the right hand of power. So God the Father can't be animate. He's power. Power. He me power. <laughs> you mean me power. Power, wow, wow, wow. Wow, wow, wow. wow. You be, yeah, you be. It's a shame. Who would deny that God the Father is animate, conscious, intelligent, has a mind, awareness, he knows, he's aware he exists, just because he's called light and power. If you've had him at the home, he's a myth of Ah, But let me show you something else. Sorry, John 1, 3 to 4. My bad, my bad, sorry. In Greek, English and Greek. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Guys, look at where it says, Panta di autu agenita. Panta all di through or by autu him agenita. Do you guys see the word agenita? Agenita comes from ginomai. Ginomai means to be brought into being. Be brought into being. To come into existence. Okay, now I want you to catch this. Sorry about that, yeah. Again, Ita. To be brought into being, to come into existence. So John 1, 3 says, all things, the all came into being through him. But now I want you to catch John 1, 4 again. Now watch here, it says, in him was life. En auto, en auto, en auto zoe ein. In, en Auto in him, Zoe ain't life was. Okay, life was in auto, Zoe ain't Zoe ain't life was. Remember what ain't is? Ain't is the imperfect tense of I mean. So, literally, it's saying in him was continually life, life was continually in him, he was existing. Continually with life in him. Now the question is, when it says life was continually in him, when was this life continually in him? Before all things came into being. Meaning, before all things came into being, the word was continually existing with life in him. Life was continuously in him before all things were created. Meaning he eternally exists with life in him. That's why in 1 John verses 1 to 2, he said to be the eternal life with the Father. 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 to 2.
that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. So we physically handled him. Who did you physically handle and physically see? Concerning the word of light, meaning the one who reveals what life is. The life was manifested. Not only does he reveal life, he is life itself that appeared. He is life that we saw. We have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And so John says that Word who was, was with God is the eternal life that was with the Father that appeared, we saw, and physically touched. And you want to prove to me Jesus is not God Almighty? Jesse, is that what you want to prove to me? Jesus is not God Almighty? Jesse, fucking M3, call me Thai. Luther, Luther. So John 1, yeah, that one too, you can use. John 1, one of the most powerful passages in the Bible, referring to Jesus as the absolute eternal God who's not the Father, which is why we're Trinitarians. Now let me give you another connection with the word in the prologue and Jesus in the narrative. The word in the pro prologue with Jesus in the narrative. John 1, verses 1 to 2. And we'll be done with John after this. John 1, verses 1 to 2. Notice it says, the word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. The words with God is pros on theon. Let me show you this very expression elsewhere in John's gospel. John 13, 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that it had come from God, was going to God. You know what the word to God is? Pros, con, theon, the same expression. Who would deny that when John says Jesus is going to God, it means he's going to go to God as a distinct person, face to face in intimate communion? Pros, con, theon, nobody. So then why would you deny? That the word who was with God before creation was there as a distinct person in intimate face-to-face -face communion. You get my point? But there's an even better one. John 16, 25 to 28. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. But the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language. Emphasize this. I won't speak to you in figurative language but i will tell you plainly about the father and that day you will ask him and i do not say to you that, that i pray the father for you. father himself you because you have loved me and i believe that i came forth from god i came forth from the father and have come into the world and again i leave the world and go to the father the phrase to the father is pros con patera Pros tan petera. Okay, now, Jesus said, I'm not speaking figuratively, I'm speaking clearly. Now, who would deny that Jesus actually left the world as an actual conscious person and went back to the Father as an actual distinct person in fellowship with the Father? No one denies that. Then why do you deny the first half? If his leaving the world, to go to the Father, Prostan Patera, is an actual conscious leaving where he goes as an actual conscious, distinct person in fellowship with the Father, then the coming down into the world from the Father must also be actual, personal, conscious. You can't have one without the other. You, you understand? By the way, I use this very argument. I use this very argument in my debate with Stephen Ritchie and Roger Perkins. They didn't know what to do. Those oneness heretics, they got discombobulated. Do you see? Jesus said, I'm not speaking figur figuratively, but plainly, right? And plainly, he said, I came from the Father into the world. I'm leaving the world going to the Father. Prostan Patera. Now, who would deny that the going to the Father, exiting the world, is something he does actually, personally, consciously, as a living, animate, distinct person from the Father. None of them. Then why do they deny the first half? 
that his coming from the Father into the world, he came from the Father as an actual, animated, animate person, distinct from the Father, into the world to become flesh. You can't have one without the other, right? Are you getting it or you're not getting it? I want to make sure you get this point because we just destroyed Jesse and Brandon and everyone else in one setting. Okay, so now let's see if the apostles got it. John 16, 29 to 30. His disciples said to him, watch here. After he just said, I'm going to speak plainly, no more figurative language, plainly. His disciples said to him, see now you are speaking plainly. What you just said about coming from the Father into the world, leaving the world, going to the Father, you are not speaking figuratively, heretics. He's speaking plainly. See now, you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need to, that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. So because you're speaking plainly, now we know you know all things and came forth from God. Plainly, not figuratively. And did Jesus say, hush, shut your mouth. John 16, 31. Jesus answered them. Do you now believe? Finally? You finally got it? Shut your mouth. Light ain't animate, son. Word ain't a person. Power ain't a person. Aren't you stupid? La, 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 man. So let's go back to John 13, 3 one more time. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things in, into his hands and that he had come from God, was going to God. So again, pros, ton, on same expression in John 1, 1 to 2. So you ask them, did Jesus go to God as an actual living person to be in face-to-face -face communion with God? They'll say yes, right? So then why do you deny that his coming from God wasn't an actual person coming from God, but an idea that became a reality? You stupid. You can't have one without the other, sucker. He can't, had come from God and was going to God. You're very stupid. Why is the one actual, the other is figurative? Son. Now let me give you the final example where the word pros is used in a context. No one will deny. I'll give you two more. That refers to an actual personal communion between two distinct persons and face-to-face -face relationship. Let's go to 1 John 2.1. Another heretic. Man, I, I, instead of having blood sausage, I'm going to have a bloody heretic. <laughs> All right. My little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an ad advocate with the Father. Right now, with the Father. Pros ton patera. Jesus Christ the righteous. Would anyone deny pros ton patera means Jesus is there as an actual living, animate person distinct from the Father. That was in 1 John 1, 2 as well. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was with the Father, prostant patera, and now is with, is with the Father, prostant patera. 1 John 1, 2, 1 John 2, 1. See? Okay, we made a thorough case that John 1 sh shows that Jesus is the absolute eternal God that became flesh. It's over. So you got Titus 2.13, 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1 with 1.11. You got Matthew 1.22, 23 with Matthew 28.20. 20. And now you got John 1, explain, explicated in light of the Old Testament, New Testament, irrefutable proof. Jesus is not a creature, a mere human, a manifestation of the Father. He's God Almighty, the eternal word, distinct from the Father, and one with the Spirit. You got it right there. That was a very robust explication another fancy term and the erudition erudition was quite profound and robust if i do say so myself now i'm going to give you some that are not as explicit that are implicit they're not as explicit but they are implicit nuggets that i've mentioned in the past nuggets that people overlook because they don't read Contextually, Mark 5, 9 to 10. This one, no one's going to deny the connection. My name is Legion, for we are many. And he also begged the ministry that he would not send them out of the country. Now, go to Mark 5, 19 to 20 real quick. I want to check something out. This is the Mark in parallel, guys. I'm just 
working something in my mind. We're going to go to Luke, but I just want to see the Mark in parallel in a minute. The evidence comes from the Luke version of the story where he's casting out the Legion. You see Legion, right? So you saw that Mark 5, 9 and 10, it's the story of the Legion, the demoniacs. And Mark 5, 19 and 20, however, Jesus not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends, tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. And how he has compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. Does anyone deny that Mark just identified the Lord who had done great things for that man as Jesus? Because notice what Jesus told them to do. Go and tell them the great things the Lord has done for you and that he had compassion on you. And the man went around telling them the things that Jesus had done for him. So who is the Lord who had done these things for him, showing him compassion? Mark tells you, Jesus. And the man realized Jesus is that Lord, right? This is not where it's amazing. No, this is The Mark conversion is amazing, but no, not yet. You haven't seen nothing yet. Watch what Luke does with this. Watch what Luke does with this. Wait, the Luke. But before we go to Luke, the Greek is even more amazing. If you put the Greek of Mark 5, 19 to 20, you're going to get even more blown away. Okay, now I want you to see the word for Lord. You see, it's O Kirius, O Kirius, the Lord, O Kirius. But now notice then words for Jesus, O Jesus, O Jesus, the Jesus, the Jesus. What? The Lord, O Kirius, the Jesus, O Jesus, the Jesus, O Jesus. Another thing you need to keep in mind. In Greek, even proper names will have the definite article appearing before them in some instances. So you'll find in Greek, Peter called the Peter, the Thomas, the John, the Paul. Now notice here, it says, O Kyrios, the Lord, and then it says, O Jesus, the Jesus. So in the Greek, there is no way of escaping the fact the Lord, O Kyrios, is the Jesus, O Jesus, right? Because both Kyrios and Jesus have the definite article, making the connection that much stronger, right? Luke 8.39. Luke 8.39, thucker. The Luke in parallel. Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. And the Greek is even more powerful. It says, tell them what O Theos has done for you. And he went telling people what O Jesus had done for him. You see, it's O Theos, the God, O Theos. And he went around telling people what O Jesus, 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 the Jesus had done. Jesus is the God. Jesus is the Lord who did these great things for him. So Mark and Luke identify the Jesus as the Lord, the God. We are. And you know what's amazing? I had seen this connection years ago, but because I hadn't heard it from any other Christian apologist, I'm like, man, am I reading too much? And guess what happened? Robert Bowman Jr. came up with his book, Putting Jesus in His Place, and he made the same connection. So now I knew I'm not the heretic I thought I was. We are the champions, my friend. Here's one that I have yet to hear a Christian use as a proof text for Jesus' deity, which is why I don't use it. You know why? Because unfortunately, early on, I was duped into thinking, well, you got to get scholarship to agree. And I'm still learning to die to that. So I'm saying, hold on, hold on. Anyone else say this? No? Maybe I'm wrong. And I'm dying to that. Now I say, you know what? You can take your PhD with the Quran, and then you can shove it, mister. Let me show you another proof text to the deity of Christ. You ready? One that I have yet to see used by people. I've used it in previous sessions in an article. But with some, here's another fancy word, Moses. I use it with some trepidation. Ooh, I use some trepidation. 
Ooh, that was very erudite. <laughs> what a mech. All right. First Timothy 1, 12 to 16. Watch here. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord. Notice Paul praises Jesus in worship and prayer. I thank Jesus. I thank Jesus, Christ Jesus, our Lord was enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a, per a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. So you notice, I'm thanking Christ Jesus because he empowered me, showing that Jesus is worshipped as God and does things that God does. Because he's in heaven, empowering his servants on earth, preserving them by his strength. Because he, Jesus, counted me faithful, right? And it says, the grace of our Lord, the favor of Jesus, was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This love and faith I have, I have from Jesus to Jesus. Now watch here. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy. That in me, first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering. Jesus much, might show how patient he is, how tolerant, tolerant he is with us because he desires to save us as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him, Jesus Christ, for everlasting life. Now, before I move on, can anyone deny that all throughout that section, it is Jesus that Paul is referring to? He's thanking Jesus in worship. That's, that's prayer and worship. Jesus empowers him on earth to remain faithful, showing Jesus does things in heaven for people on earth that God does. It's the favor of Jesus that saved Paul. Jesus was patient with Paul in order to lead him to repentance as a sign that Jesus is patient with us, waiting for us to turn to him to be saved. No doubt it's Jesus, right? Because I'm almost done, truth, fine. No one else, right? This is my final point too. So I want you to hear the final point. There's no one else in the context, right, guys? Then why don't they then quote verse 17 as another proof text for Jesus being God? 1 Timothy 1, 17. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible. invisible. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible. To God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now convince me he didn't just break out in praise of Jesus. That he's saying, Jesus, who did this for me, as an example of what he'll do for you, save you. He is the king eternal, immortal, invisible, because we can't see him now. He's hidden. He is the God who alone is wise. To him be glory, honor forever and ever. Amen. If Jesus is God in absolute sense, and Paul could call Jesus our great God and Savior in Titus 2.13, and the only great God and Savior anyone has is Yahweh, then why wouldn't Paul call him? King, eternal, immortal, the God who alone is wise, worthy of eternal praise. Why? So now I use it. You know why? Because I don't care about scholarship. Daniel Wallace, I love you, bro. Mikey Laconi, I love you too, sir. God use you mightily. But you're not perfect. You're not infallible. You make a lot of mistakes and errors. So take that PhD with the Quran. Use it for toilet paper, son. La, 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 la. All right. Lord bless you guys.